My name is Lars Jakob Bø. I am a senior partner in Bain & Company. I advise executives in large institutions, primarily in the financial services industry, private equity, and also in energy. I started looking at blockchain roughly five years ago, and uh, my conclusion over these five years is that this is a new technology that will have severe impact on financial institutions. And I'll try to explain a little bit why. Let me start with a few questions. What bank executives should ask themselves? First of all, what is Web3 and is it relevant for me? The second question, how will it actually impact my business? And the third question, which actually is a consequence of the second, is should I be worried? And eventually, what should I do? We are traveling around engaging with banks these days. And these are exactly the questions we're asking. Let me take a step back. I mean, I guess I'm speaking to the converted if I talk about Web 1, Web 2, Web 3 here in this, in this audience. Web 1 was about information. Web 2 was about communication. You actually put something into the web as well. Web 3 is about exchanging value. It completes the internet. So you can read, you can write, you can actually also exchange value. It's decentralized, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, without intermediation. Another sort of conceptual slide. You have to bear with me, I'm a consultant, so we do have these. The reason why I have this is that I want to present the notion of digital assets, because that's very important for banks. Digital assets is sort of like part of the blockchain arena. But it's not the full part, because there's also definitely applications outside the financial services industry, the D-apps, where blockchain comes to, comes to bear. But let's me talk about digital, digital assets a little bit. There are two types of digital currencies, as you know. It's the digital currencies, the bitcoins of this world. Then there's the CBDC and the stable coins. Furthermore, there are digital tokens, and they can be asset-based, meaning there's an asset backing the digital asset that you own. It could be a real estate asset, could be a, a company, could be a piece of art. And they can be fungible or non-fungible. And then we have the tokens without ties to the real world. Collectibles, etc. Could also have value, we've seen that. Let me now start a little bit about where I see this industry. Uh, first of all, it's important to note that this is a very young industry. You're probably all familiar with the maturity curve concept. We are very much to the left. Even if it's 13 or 14 years old, since uh, the Bitcoin paper came, this is a young industry. So that's the first point to make. However, we believe it's actually approaching what we would call an inflection point, meaning the point where it starts to grow, where the S starts to take shape. So the second point I want to make is that financial services at really at the forefront of this. This is where it started. Payments. Peer-to-peer -peer means disintermediation. Banks prosper from intermediation. So that's, that's important to have. It's a young industry. Banks are at the front. Then poor bank executives, they need to, to, to uh, handle a lot of new concepts. We talked about blockchain. There is the tokens, NFTs and regular tokens. There is the wallets and the currencies. There is the decentralized finance. There is uh, smart contracts which allow you to, to uh, do things more efficiently and also with compliance. There is the D-apps. There is the uh, distributed autonomous organizations. To be honest with you, when I... Web 1 and Web 2 was easy for the, the banks to understand and executives to understand that this is something we need to do. This is more difficult. When I talk to bank executives, a lot of them don't really understand this. They haven't got it. The first, I remember a year ago, I was going to take, I was going to talk to one of the CEOs in one of the bigger Northern European banks. And I said, we need to talk about, we need to talk about blockchain and Web3. And he said, no, we don't do that. Why? No, it's too risky. Uh, do you mean Bitcoin? Yeah. Yeah, but this is much more. This is much more than Bitcoin. But still, you know, there is a lot of people that have the same attitude. 
But this is not easy. They need to spend time on it. Second point to make is that when it comes to digital assets, we believe it's going to grow remarkably and actually work in parallel with traditional securities, in particular the asset-based tokens and the stable coins with CBDC, we believe will become much bigger than what we see today. There is a prediction, oh, there's many predictions, but HSBC and Northern Trust estimates roughly 5 to 10% of world assets currently at, or world assets on public exchanges, currently at $300 trillion, will be digital in uh, seven years. And seven years is fast. That's, that's, that could be 15 to $30 trillion in digital assets that we will own and trade and exchange, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized, without intermediation. The venture capital community is expecting to spend a lot of money on this. 50 billion is the number that has come up. I think it was roughly 40 last year, okay. This year there is a downturn, and maybe what, what the, the venture capital market will decline, but it's gonna be a serious amount of money that is deployed against this, this technology. But it's not just venture companies and, and uh, these new applications. It's also about enterprises. And we have had, we've asked uh, a bunch of these enterprises, more than 100 of them, or roughly 100 of them, and uh, all of them with more than 1 billion in revenue. And first of all, they're all saying we're looking at this. They're all saying, um, almost half of them are saying, yeah, this is uh, probably going to impact my industry. But they haven't put it on the agenda yet, meaning the next two, three years, we have other priorities. Then on the other side, even more serious, only one-fifth of them believe that they're set up to succeed in this area, meaning they don't understand it, they don't have the organization capabilities, etc., etc. And then I think a lot of people say, I don't really understand this yet. So there's a way to go before this takes off. They're not going to deploy a lot of money against this technology before they understand it and believe the organization can handle it. Other obstacles to overcome when we ask them is the regulatory area. The regu regulation is unfinished. And this is, of course, a problem for banks who are basically run by regulators, that everybody, executives in banks, can't sleep thinking about what the regulators can do to them. And then I think there's another point as well. I mean, this is about IT. Most banks have very complex, old, legacy IT systems from the 70s, and they're just, they're just collapsing, thinking about what will happen if I also now add blockchain onto this, this uh, infrastructure. So integrating blockchain into the existing infrastructure will be a problem. So to summarize the first question, blockchain is here to stay. Banks need to take it serious. And I believe it's very close to an inflection point, meaning that things will go faster the next few years. And then how will it impact my business? Customers, opportunities and disruption. Well, on the customer side, it will change the way that customers use banks and interact with banks. On the opportunity side, there will be new revenue opportunities, there will be automation, efficiency opportunities, and then there is disruption threats. I'll get back to that. Better, faster, cheaper service. Blockchain will provide you with uh, speed, of, uh, speed, less errors, removes the need for reconciliation, it will be absolutely correct what is done, efficiency. Digital identity will, for instance, make KYC processes more, more efficient. Banks have thousands of people deployed against these processes today. On the digital currency side, they will be able to transact with more efficiency and with uh, around the clock. On the tokenization side, if I own a company that is not liquid, the banks will be able to help me liquidize this. I will be able to invest in new products because digital assets represent new products. And then on the smart contract side, it provides me opportunities to automate processes I can't automate today. 
This will change the way that customers seek advice, the way they invest, the way they earn return, the way they safeguard their assets. Custody is, by the way, one of the applications that will come first. JP Morgan just uh, went to a blockchain uh, custody solution. It'll change the way that people borrow money, for instance, with digital assets as collateral. It'll change the way they manage risk, and by the way, it will also reduce the risk. I'll get back to that. And also the way they do payments. This is an interesting slide because it basically shows the potential for digital assets. There is, in, there is roughly 300 billion as, a trillion, as I mentioned, dollars in investable assets on exchanges available to the public. However, this is roughly twice that amount in values, illiquid, not tradable, not available. So, digital asset can make this liquid if you need liquidity, if you own a company, you can sell parts of it, if you own a piece of art, you can sell it. And particularly the real estate market, this is a, there's a huge potential infrastructure as well. So it offers new opportunities for banks to sell new products, new revenue streams. So it's not just negative. On the efficiency side, this is just one example. We believe, by the way, that 50% of the bank's cost base can be made more efficient by blockchain. 50% of a bank's cost base. But also on the capital side, the banks hold $3 trillion against settlement risk, counterparty risk, and operational risk. Risks that will be reduced with blockchain. On liquidity, banks hold roughly $2 trillion in high-quality liquid assets against, uh, against liquidity issues related to settlement and foreign exchange, for instance. These are, these are money that the banks can get back if they deploy blockchain solutions and if regulation follows through. This is also a regulatory issue for us. So, second question, will it impact my business? Severely so. And it actually implies just, not just risks, but also opportunities for you. Then, what we're seeing is that attackers are coming into this space, just like the other fintech space, we now see attackers coming up with business models within exchanges, within payments, within lending, within uh, decentralized finance, custody, I mentioned before, etc. So it's actually happening at a rapid pace. We see new companies with new solutions that customers can use. So this is a threat, of course. Banks risk disintermediation. Today, Banks are prospering from disintermediation. Lack of transparency, they love it. That's where they make their money. The ability to find a buyer for a seller. The, uh, the, uh, the opportunities to sit and control processes between, between people in brokerage, etc. Disintermediation is a real threat. Disconnection from global market is also, an op it also a threat. Where things will happen peer to peer and the banks will just be behind the scene. And then, of course, decline. They will uh, lose revenues in certain areas, no doubt. And for those that haven't figured that out, it's time to look at it. And we also see now parallel ecosystems evolving, meaning that you have the traditional ecosystems. This is just an example of, uh, of trading and, and, and investments, where you have uh, the whole value chain with the traditional players. And then you have a web tree. You can do this on web tree now. You can do this on blockchain. You can, you can uh, issue a security, you can trade it, you can take care of it afterwards, and you can sell it. So the second, uh, the third question, should I be worried? Yes and no. If you sit still and think this will blow away, you should be. However, if you lean forward and pursue the opportunities, you can actually benefit from it. And we do see some banks, the leading banks, are taking charge. I guess you all remember, uh, or at least some of you will remember, Jimmy Diamond first, in JP Morgan, first uh, comment around 
around Bitcoin and blockchain some years back, where he says this is just for crooks, it's not for us. JP Morgan is now moving fast in this area. They have introduced a stablecoin where their business to business customers can, can transact. They have uh, just recently actually gone into a Bitcoin based custody system. Goldman Sachs, Fidelity, ING, lots of companies moving in this space. But most of them are experimenting. There are very few solutions at scale today. But it's clear that the banks have the capital, they have the brands, they can play in this game. I mean, they even have the opportunity to buy the leading and successful blockchain startups and to be really part of this. So things are happening. And just to summarize, what now? Uh, yes, I believe Web3 is a technological tidal wave which is approaching an inflection point over the next few years, meaning that growth will accelerate. How will it impact my business? Well, over time it will impact a lot. It will impact the way you organize yourself, the way you handle your customers, the products you offer. It will basically transform you over time. And should I be worried? Yeah, if you don't take this seriously, you should be worried. You can be disrupted, you can be disconnected, your business can come into decline. And then eventually the fourth question, what should I do? Well, it's time to act. I think the risk here is inaction. An interesting thing is that I see inaction. Lots of places. But this will be a space where there will be winners and losers. Some banks will get it, some won't. And as always, the ones that don't will eventually be, be uh, taken over and somebody will, will fix it for them. Thank you. <laughs>